All right, thank you guys. Have a seat. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. This is dessert. Um, we'll be talking about GA stuff today a bit, but I'm hoping to kind of extend it to a more general discussion about how some of us as developers fit into the whole field of marketing analysis. So I want to start with something, what I think is my, my developer philosophy, um, for GA especially, but also to other stuff as well. And I think that it's, uh, I don't, I, I, I like to think that it's a very healthy way to up, um, approach building things. So when you want to build something, if you build it, data will come. So everything is about prototyping. Uh, the things I do at home are, are, you know, I write code and see if it works. If it works, I start thinking of an application for it. Other times I might have an application idea, I write for it, see if it's possible to do with the code, and it might work or might not. But the thing is that if you want to develop for GA, if you want to develop for anything, you actually have to do this stuff. You have to be really passionate about it and not just do it on a whim or, or as a hired gun, which I guess most developers can, can subscribe to. The other thing about the web is that Almost nothing is untrackable on a website, as David smartly wrote in Twitter one day. So this means that because the web itself is just a collection of JavaScript built around a browser engine, and then we have HTML5 markup and stuff like that, we can actually do a very good uh, representation of what a user does on the, with the browser. We can, we can measure their actions. We can measure mouse, mouse movement. We can measure keyboard presses. We can measure all this kinds of stuff. And we can put that together in our analytics platform to get more granular data. The thing is, however, that the web is actually stateless. So it's very difficult to see what happened in the past. It's very difficult to see, understand what's going to happen in the future if you're a, if you're a piece of JavaScript because all you're left to work with is something that doesn't really tell you about intent. So no matter how many keyboard presses we measure, no matter how many mouse movements we try to track, we're still left with the fundamental question of, of analytics is what, what is the user actually trying to achieve? And this is now a representation of what the average lifespan of a web page is. It starts when the person enters the web page and it ends when the person leaves the page. In this period between the entrance and the exit, the whole page is built from scratch. The document object is built from scratch. The cookie, cookies are loaded from your, from your text files. Everything is built from scratch. It's a stateless being that you are actually build, rebuilding with every single page load. And the problem with this is that if you now try to identify user intent, which usually spans more than just one web page, you get into trouble. Like, how do you know what they did on the previous page? How do you know what they did yesterday? How do you know what they did a week ago with maybe with a different device altogether? We might use browser cookies. We might use HTML storage. It's not really a solution. It's a band-aid to the problem. We use cookies as temporary state to induce, introduce temporary state. So we might have a cookie which stores if you're a returning visitor. So a website finds your cookie in the browser and knows that, hey, this guy has been here before, so he's a returning visitor. I can delete my cookies. I usually do. Well, well, I don't, but the hypoth hypothetical, I can do that. Um, I can keep account of how many articles the person has read during that session. Again, it's not very scientific. How do we increase that counter with every page load or when the transition is from one page to the other? So it's not really a solution. So because these things provide you with temporary state only, we need something that is actually stateful, that can actually make something out of this mess. So, for example, we have Google Analytics. It's a, back -end, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of software that lies on a server in the back end that collects your data from the hits. So we use Google Analytics as a stateful machine to make sense out of these hits that originate in a stateless environment. So all the hits, I, I'm not allowed to use the word hits, right? That was what we learned today. So all the impulses, all the requests from the website are stored in Google Analytics, and Google Analytics tries to make sense of them. So this is an example of state. If you've read the um, Google Analytics developer guides or the um, stuff about custom dimensions, you'll know this picture. This is from, from the official developer guide. This is just an example how Google Analytics maintains state. So here we have an example of how user scope dimension works. So state is applied to this user entity. All the hits that come after the dimension is applied are included in this bucket, in this state of the user. 
And this isn't translated back to the website. There's no kind of data coming back to the website that, hey, the current visitor is a registered user because there's no interface for that. So Google Analytics is intrinsically better at pattern matching because it tries to make sense of these, these, these impulses that it receives, and it builds the patterns out of them. But it only works if the input itself is good. So if you install Google Analytics on your website right now, you'll be measuring page views. And you'll just be collecting those page views and, and trusting that it's a good KPI for you when it's combined with other stuff. Maybe even sessions works for you. But the problem is that this is a default impulse. This is a default request that every single platform that uses Google, every single website that uses Google Analytics must send. Otherwise, the data will look weird. So in the interface between the stateless and the stateful, is the data that's going from one location to the other. So the only way that we have a healthy representation of data in Google Analytics is if we learn to understand what's meaningful data. And this, I think, is where the, like, the enlightened developer or the enlightened marketer is very comfortable in because they can actually tell you or they should be able to arrive at the conclusion that for your business, what is meaningful data? And the, well, obviously, how do we find this meaningful data? I actually want to reformulate this, and, and how do we ask the right questions? How are we inspired enough to ask the right questions and thus change the quality of data that's coming into the data? So one question that I, I want to use in a use case, I talked about page views, which the name itself implies that it's a view of a page. What about if the user didn't actually view a page? Is it still a page view? Would you still accept your data? to tell you that you have now thousands of page views. They didn't view the page. So let's say I open a link in a browser tab and never return to it. That's a page view in GA, right? That's collected as a page view hit. I'm not viewing the page. I'm not, I'm not getting anything back from it. Should I be including that as a page view? For some businesses, that's a very relevant question. If, if you have a blog where a page view is actually a very important thing, you want to know if people are reading your articles, um, this becomes a relevant question. So, um, I wanted to know if this is actually something we can measure with GA. And first of all, HTML5 is an amazing thing. It has all these different APIs that you can tap into to find ideas. This is like a developer's heaven. All you have to do is Google around a little and find the coolest JavaScript thing and then implement it and see if it brings you meaningful data. Well, here's just a very small handful of APIs that you can access through HTML5. The one I want to focus on is visibility. So there's actually an API for visibility. Um, what it does is it gives you this, now I have an example from my blog. I have a blog post open on the visible page, and then I have another blog post waiting for me to read, but it's in a tab that I'm, I'm not active, activated yet. Now, this first tab is visible, and the other is hidden, and we actually have an API to query whether or not a certain page is visible or hidden. It's a property of the document object, so the document object actually has a property called hidden that you can query. It returns a Boolean value. You can try it on your JavaScript console if you want to, but you can't try it if the page is hidden because you can't access the console. Haha. <laughs> so anyway, document hidden is false if the page is visible, and it's true if it's not. So we have this to test it with. We can test if the page is visible using this. On top of that, it gives us an event listener. So we can actually listen for when the visibility changes. So when I click the second tab, it will dispatch an event into the browser, and you can actually listen to that and make note, hey, visibility changed, let's do something. So the way I formulate this API into a meaningful question for, for getting meaningful data is this. When a page is loaded in a hidden state, do not send a page view. The page is not viewed. I do not accept the fact that it's a page view. If the visibility of the page changes, then send the page view, because then they're actually viewing the page. And First of all, we have to know when we work with APIs, especially when we work with HTML5, browser compatibility is an issue. So we have to know which kind of environments accept this kind of code. And if we know that, for example, IE, surprisingly, playing against, fighting against the flow here, IE 8 and 9 do not have visibility API. You cannot query document hidden with them. So either you come up with a fall up that we call a polyfill. So either you come up with a way to make IE8 and IE9 work similarly to the visibility API, 
or you then just let the data flow through for those browsers. I, I took the latter path. So if you're trying this with IE8 or IE9, it's always a page view. So they are back, they're like regressing back to the stone ages with that. So this is just something you have to be aware of. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail with the code st and stuff. It's all in my blog. I'm just getting clicks this way. This is clickbaiting at the best. So you can just check it out. I have an article about this. But I wanna walk you through the process so you understand what I've been thinking about when I talk about meaningful data. So first we have a page that's loaded in browser. The first thing we wanna do is check if the visibility API is supported or not. If it's not supported, we just fire the page through. This was the fallback plan. We just let the visits flow through. If it is supported, the next thing we wanna know, first we add the event listener there through, uh, this is all GTM by the way, so I, I've done this through GTM. We add a listener which listens for changes. We set it up upon the page load. The next thing we wanna ask, is the page visible? Because if the page is visible, then everything is fine. Let's just fire the page view, remove the listener, and go on with our lives as, as, you know, as we should. If the page isn't visible, we'll stay in the shadows lurking, waiting for the event to be dispatched. So now we just wait. And when, when Doug then clicks the browser tab and opens, it makes the page active, it sends the visibility change event. And now that we got the event, we can fire the page views and now the page is visible again. So this way, when you look at your page views, you can be just a bit more comfortable with the fact that they are actually representing something that might be important to you. Um, so what just actually happened is that we tried to make a metric more meaningful, but it's only meaningful for me and my questions. For your questions, a page view might very well be the fact that people don't view the page. So, this is another thing that I wanna, wanna really enforce is that no one should be telling you like this kind of stuff, this is the only way to do it. It's a developer question, it's a marketer question, but in the end it's a business question. So this might be a cool way to identify page views, but it might not be relevant for your business. This has to be said as a disclaimer. So that's one way. Uh, the other way to do it is, is the age old holy grail of content engagement. How do we measure it? How do we measure how people actually interact with our content, because it's, it's notoriously difficult to track. Um, how many have heard of adjusted bounce rate? How many think it's a really, really cool thing to do? It's a leading question. Oh, I have one hand up at least. So the adjusted bounce, bounce rate works like this. Not happy with your bounce rate? Sure, let's tweak it a little. Let's make it lower by adding some timer or something. So, just tweak the data collection method. Just add there something that lowers the bounce rate. Don't worry about the fact that your content sucks, which is why the bounce rate is really high. Let's just tweak the metrics. Not happy with your conversion rate? Add your home page as a destination goal. You'll see your conversion rate go up instantly, I promise you. So stop tweaking the metrics because that's stupid stuff. Try to think of the big real reason back there. Why is your bounce rate so high? Do you have like internal linkings? Do you do, you do that stuff at all? Do you have related posts? All these kinds of stuff. So I'm, I'm not very happy with adjusted bounce rate. Do not look for it on my blog. I might have an article I wrote about it some time ago, but do not look for it. Scroll tracking, how many have heard of scroll tracking? Like scroll depth, okay, even more, which this is good. So this is from Cutroni, Justin Cutroni's blog. Um, he's not the brains behind this, but he, he did make it very popular. The idea is that you send an event to GA when you pass certain milestones on the scrolling action of the page, like zero, 25%, 50%, 75%, and then the whole article. This is pretty good. Um, I mean, it's much better than adjusted bounce rate. It actually tells you if people are scrolling through your content. The problem, for example, for me as a publisher, because I have a blog that I, I love, like my own baby, is that it isolates the action of reading. So the action of reading becomes the only qualification of engagement. I'll be looking at those scroll depth reports and seeing like conversion only occurs when they've like reached the end or maybe at 50%. But the way I want to think about it is like this. Content is to a blog what a product is to a web store. My blog is my web store. I'm selling my content. I don't have a paywall. You don't actually see money exchange hands. But I'm treating it religiously like it were my web store and I want to measure it like a web store. And what's the way to measure a web store? Well, Joshua showed us today, funnels. So put the people through a funnel, make an elaborate funnel out of your content page and see how they fall through and what kind of articles are, are reaching the kind of targets you have set for them. So this is the shopping behavior. I've changed it to reading behavior. 
These are examples from my blog. So I'm actually measuring my blog with enhanced e-commerce right now. I can see that I had, last week I had like 7,000 sessions. Um, I had 6,000 of them had like product views. So they saw an ingress or a title of my article. Um, five and a half thousand, no sorry, these are like detail views. So I, people actually opened the product. Then I saw that five and a half thousand actually started reading. Add to cart on my blog is starting reading the text. Checkout, I have checkout in three phases. There's one third, two thirds, and three thirds. So that's the scroll depth plugin. That's my checkout funnel. And finally, a transaction occurs when someone spends an arbitrary amount of time. I chose 60 seconds on a page and has reached the end of content. So now I can actually see how my blog is directing people to do the stuff I want them to do, which is in this case to read the articles. We have checkout behavior, which is now content engagement in my, my kind of little weird world. So I can see that 5,000 read one third, then there's a drop off rate of, I don't have my glasses, 20%, so 20% less read two thirds. That's not 20, but that's something else. So, and reached end of content, 3,000. So 3,000 out of 4,500 reached end of content. And transaction, again, quite a steady decline. So we can see that there is a, is a path like people, most people only read the top third, right? They just skim through it and see if it's good for them and then they leave. And if people reach this, they're, I think they're deliberately trying to make me happy, which is nice. Then we have product performance. It's article performance now. Um, you might wonder where this revenue comes from. This was my, my idea. It's actually the number of words in an article is the price of the article. So I can see that last week, 5,200,000 words were read on my blog and, and as a purchase, which is, which is a completely arbitrary number, but it's something to you know, use as a pickup line in the worst bar in history. Um, <laughs> average price, average number of words that were read is just under 2,000, which is pretty, makes sense. I, I write about my articles are usually about 2,000 words long. Then the cart to detail rate, well, that doesn't tell me too much because I, I'm going to show you soon how I do that. But the buy to detail rate is important because if you load an article page and you buy it, this is the ratio. So we can see that articles with less words, my e-commerce tips for Google Tag Manager has 2,500 2, 2, words, 35% actually bought it who saw the page. A longer article like um, Variable Guy, which is a whopping 5,000 words, only 12% read. So the longer the article, the less people read it, which makes sense in a way. I could try to fix that up by adding internal linking, making menus like, like article navigation and stuff. So this is a way to optimize it. Try If my goal were to make people reach the end quick, but it's not, I want them to actually read it with, with forethought. Uh, then there's the product list, which is now content list. So I have these different lists. I have widgets. If you have WordPress, you can create a product list out of your most recent posts, your main posts. Search results is a good product list, of course. We can see that some of these are failing terribly, like recent comments, only nine clicks out of 83,000 views. So I might want to drop that away completely. Like nobody, nobody clicks through other articles through a recent comments post. Um, what else can I see? Well, the main post, which is the home page, of course, it has a pretty high uh, CTR, but the other, the categories and tags, not so much. This is like, this is for me to optimize my site with. It. Because if people don't use those, why have them there? Um, then we have internal promotions. Well, I just have a single promotion. I have a quick link to all my GTM articles. I just wanted to see if people use that. So I can see that there's a click-through rate of 3.65, and I can see that 16 articles were actually read after the internal promotion had been clicked. So, you know, 50% transactions. I don't know what I'm going to do with this data. It's just there right now. I want to test it, but, you know, someday it might be relevant for me. This is all stuff for me to optimize by blog with. I'm not going to start writing shorter articles to make people buy more, but at least now I'll know there's a correlation so I can start thinking about how to make people kind of come back to the article maybe or do stuff like that. So if you want to implement a thing like this, so now what I'm talking about is taking an existing feature and using it for something completely different. I don't use the word hacking because this isn't hacking. This is just bending GA to your will. Um, the first thing you have to do is come up with a terminology. So the Things in red are the terminology that GA enforces you to accept. I would love to be able to change those in the interface. And the gray ones are the ones that I've actually used on my blog. So we can see that 
a product is an article, product price is words in an article, impression view subtitle. Then we have the product detail view is when you load an article page. So when you click an ingress or a title and you load the actual article, that's a detail view. Once you start scrolling, that's an add to cart. So you're kind of shopping around. Maybe I'll buy this article. I'll start reading, see what happens. And check out is the scroll depth plugin. So once you reach one third of the post, you hit your first checkout step, two thirds, your second step, and so on. And finally, spend 60 seconds on the blog and read it completely, you have a purchase. And the step two, which is the trivial bit, this should be easy if you have a good developer with you or a good platform that lets you do this, is, is making the data layer happen. So here's uh, my homepage. The first thing I do is I annotate it. I have product impressions here. Uh, Enrich, this title is a product impression. The other title is a product impression. Then I have impressions here as well. So these are impressions of articles I want you to buy or read. And then I have my little internal promotion up there. So we build a data layer out of these. And, and this is because we're not talking about products with an actual revenue, we have to make some stuff up. The product ID with me, it's just a truncated version of the title. Because why not? I don't care. Um, then we have the promotions. And when someone clicks, I just register a click on the main post list and send the object with it. So this is all like run of the mill stuff if you do EEC and has e-commerce. This is all that stuff that you, you should be doing anyway. Next thing, I have loaded an article. This is the article that I loaded. First thing it does is it sends the product detail view instantly. So we have a product detail. Now as you see, there's the price. My price, because I know about, I know about stuff like financial markets and, and screwing with economy, I take one cent out so it looks like .99 and it looks much more pricey and, and like professional. So it's 969 words, but I use 968.99. That's, that's a tip for you guys. So anyway, I, I use the product there. And the category, again, arbitrary. I use my like, WordPress categories. Could be something else. You could add variants and brands. You could use your tags, for example. The WordPress tags could be your variants, for example. Anything you want to do. Next thing, the scrolling begins. So the instant a scrolling is detected, we send the product with the um, add object. So now we've added the product to the cart. I don't have a remove from cart. I have, I'm, I have yet to come up with how to do that in a blog. How do you remove your memory of reading the first paragraph? Some matrix stuff has to happen, I think. Then you have the checkout. So I have three steps. The one, first one, as you remember, was one third of the article. The second is two thirds. And the last one is the whole article. So the only way these differ is the step parameter is step one, two, three. And finally, we have the purchase. So we have the revenue for the transaction. The transaction ID, again, completely arbitrary. I use timestamp plus 10 random characters. So I don't use that stuff for anything. Um, otherwise, it's just your normal purchase data layer object. So tips for this, if you want to try something like this, or tips for EEC in general. Um, first of all, do use data layer. Um, <coughs> natively, so have your CMS actually output a data layer with all this information. I've, done, I've scraped the DOM, so I've actually just looked at what titles are there on the page, then use, take them, pull them into the data layer. It's very fragile. It's very fragile to operate an entire e-commerce funnel by scraping stuff. It's a big no-no. Feel free to leave something out. So I've left remove, the car, remove from card out because I have no idea how to use that. In the beginning, I didn't even have product detail views because I, did, I don't know what, what, how could I do that, but someone on my blog actually helped me out with it and told me that this is a good idea, and I tried it, and it, it was a nice idea. So now the page load is the product detail view. This is like a, this is what Gandhi would say if he, was, if he were a developer, like design the data collection with analysis in mind, not just because it's fun and cool. And this is what results in what Avinash calls the data puke if you don't do this. If you just want to collect data because now you can. GTM resulted in a whole generation of people embracing development tools and they're just you know, pushing stuff into your analytics system until you have no idea what you're going to do with all that data. So we're talking about meaningful data here. So the data collection should be designed with the actual analysis in mind. Don't, that's why I don't have remove from cart there because I have no idea how to do successful analysis on it. So instead of having it pollute my data with nonsensical information, I've left it out. Um, here's a very specific tip, oddly enough. With GTM, 
only the most recent e-commerce push is included in the payload. So if you do an e-commerce push, another push, and then you fire the tag, only the most recent push is included. This is just something I've learned along the way. Um, and finally, you know, people give Google's guides a, a very bad rep, most of it with good reason. But in this case, actually, I, I think I, you can learn everything, almost everything in the dev guides. GTM has its own dev guide for enhanced e-commerce, uh, and Universal Analytics has its own dev guide for enhanced. So by combining those two, you'll have a perfect understanding of how, your, how it actually should be implemented. And then read stuff like what Joshua writes and, and other guides out there. There are many things you can pick up. So there's an article about this, of course, further reading for you guys on my blog, which I wrote. Um, so read that. Again, go, you know, click, click some stuff. Give me products in my car, you know. Give me some revenue. Um, I'm really being sarcastic. I'm absolutely not selling. I have nothing to sell. Um, then there's the dev guide for Google developers. Very good resource. And then there's a wonderful thing that the GA DevRel team did. So they built like a mock, mock site of an actual functioning enhanced e-commerce solution. So you can actually see in real time when you click a t-shirt, you can see that it's added to the data layer. It's a very good way to learn how enhanced e-commerce works and how the data layer should work as well. So check that out. And then I also added this whole solution as a GitHub project if you want to see what I did. Like I said, it's not a very good example because I scrape everything off the DOM. I scrape everything off the pages instead of using data layer. But if you want to try it by yourself, there might be something you might want to pick up. So I want to close this session with, with a couple of resources. So um, um, GTM, for example, and GA itself, they're just JavaScript. They're JavaScript libraries that you can use very successfully if you learn JavaScript, right? So um, I have some resources here if you're interested in entering this world or if you're interested in improving yourself, because, and I suggest that everybody at least consider this possibility, especially if you work with analytics platforms. So the first one is the Code Academy JavaScript track. It's a free resource. I always pitch this because I love it. So it's a free resource that you can actually take a quite a nice interactive JavaScript track and walk through it and learn the basics. And then there are some advanced examples as well that you can, you can tap into. So that's a very good starting point if JavaScript is completely alien to you. My absolutely favorite book about JavaScript is by Nicholas Zakas, Professional JavaScript for Web Developers. It's now in his third edition, which is a couple of years old. He'll probably update it soon when, when the new version of JavaScript is published. It's a big book, but it has pretty much everything you need to know about web development and JavaScript. And, and GA for JavaScript is pretty much web development, and GTM as well. There's a book called Dom Enlightenment by Cody Lindley. Um, it's a bit more advanced, but if you want to understand how the DOM, so the document object model, how the website works, how the web page is built, it's a very good book for that. Um, and then there's like the, one of the most important JavaScript books out there by Douglas Crockford, uh, JavaScript, the good parts. This is quite advanced now, so we're talking about object-oriented programming here, actually, and prototypal inheritance and stuff like this. But if you're comfortable with learning the power of JavaScript, it's a very good book, book to take a look at. Um, and then we have, for HTML5, we have a really good MDN site. So the Mozilla Developer Network has an actual portal for almost all the APIs, good tutorials, cross-browser stuff, anything you might want to learn. And the reason I'm showing you this stuff is because if you want to do something cool with GA or GTM, and you're already a good JavaScript developer, or you understand HTML really well, it's a very short step because you can actually find the APIs and the tools you can build this stuff with, like the page visibility thing. It's just a question of Googling. Can you identify if a page is visible or not? Then you get the visibility API. So it's very interesting things you can do to make your data more meaningful for you and yourself. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.